Before you buy yourself a Toyota FJ Cruiser, there are some less than favorable things about them that you should probably know about. Hey there everyone, welcome to FJX 2000 Productions and another episode of Let's FJ. My name is Hayden and today we will be going over all the reasons why not to buy an FJ Cruiser. Just a few videos ago, I did an episode where I talked about all the things I love about FJ Cruisers and why you should definitely buy one. But I also mentioned that this was a video that I would be making soon. So while that video was all the pros of the FJ, this video is all the cons. Check out that video if you haven't already, a link will be in the description below. But like I said, today I will be telling you as many reasons as I could find why you should not buy an FJ or that you should at least be aware of before doing so. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all my subscribers for the support you give me and for all the community engagement the channel has received lately. On the last video I did about FJ Colors, I loved hearing about what FJs you all have and especially the stories of how you got them or how much you love them. There were people from all around the globe commenting, and I recently checked my channel statistics, and only 50% of my viewers are from here in the US. The rest are international. Wow, this is what it's all about. Bringing the worldwide FJ community together as one. And I'm glad my channel can be that place for everyone. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to become part of the FJX 2000 community and share this with anyone who may be considering getting an FJ. That way they are in the know when it comes to what they are getting themselves into. Anyways, let's get started. As a quick reminder, I did throw together an FJ Changes by Year video where I cover every change the FJ experienced from 2007 to 2014 here in the US. That will be extremely helpful if you haven't viewed it already, and some of the things mentioned in that video will reappear in this video, but just make sure to check it out. I'll leave the link in the description below. And for today's video, not only will I be mentioning things about the FJ that aren't so great, but I will also give advice for fixes or changes one can make to then remedy some of the FJ's problems. Hopefully it helps you out if you're experiencing any issues with your FJ, or at least it can give you some peace of mind when you're considering buying one. When it comes to the FJ Cruiser, though Toyota is known for the dependability and longevity of its vehicles, the Achilles heel of the FJ is its frame, specifically if the FJ has spent its life in the rust belt. FJ Cruiser frames are notorious for rusting out badly and getting to the point where major work is required to make them safe to drive. Worst case scenarios even necessitate a full frame replacement, which runs upwards of several thousand dollars in parts alone. So before buying an FJ, be sure the first thing you check is its frame. And if there are rust holes and thin areas, or you can tell a poor paint job was done to cover up the rust, walk away and save yourself the trouble. Now work can be done on frames with mild rust to control the situation and increase their longevity. There are lots of shops that will wire wheel the frame and clear away any rust before applying rust converting primers and protective paints to ensure a nice long life for the frame going forward. I definitely recommend this option for people if your frame is starting to show signs of rusting but is still salvageable. And if done well, it can even increase the value or resellability of the FJ going forward. The next biggest thing to know about the FJ is it was designed to pay homage to the land cruisers of the past, but due to this, there are many downsides that make the FJ less favorable in today's auto market. For starters, from an appearance standpoint, the FJ's retro aesthetic is something that turns many people away to begin with. People think it's ugly with its old style grill and round headlights, they hate the two-tone paint job with the white roof, or they dislike the weird silver trim that doesn't match well with the body color. But most importantly, since the old Land Cruisers were built like a brick, so too was the FJ Cruiser. This means wind noise is noticeable, especially if the FJ is equipped with a roof rack, and the nearly vertical windshield adds to the problem, with wind resistance being more dramatic than other cars. FJ's windshields are also notorious for catching rocks and experiencing way more rock chips and cracks than almost any other car. Many FJ owners even have the classic crack extending from one side of the windshield to the other. I even had this myself. But once the damage is done, replacing the windshield is a huge hassle that will generally be more expensive than on most other vehicles and is challenging to do right, even by an experienced shop. Reason being is the trim all around the glass must be removed and then reinstalled to do the job correctly. But the clips used to hold these trim pieces on fail if not replaced or installed correctly the first try, leading to people losing their upper molding on the highway or the left side cowl panel. 
Make sure to do your research to find a good shop to do such repairs. Even the shop that I had do my windshield did a crummy job with the cow panels, and I later bought new clips and reinstalled them myself. Just be careful. Along with being built like a brick comes poor fuel economy, especially after modifying the FJ as most owners do. The addition of larger aftermarket tires, lifts, off-road armor, and other accessories all increase the weight and wind resistance of the FJ and make its somewhat poor gas mileage even poorer. Plus, for 2007 to 2009 FJ cruisers, owners will know that Toyota recommends only premium or 91 octane fuel be used. Though an early Toyota service bulletin would clarify that regular unleaded fuels with a minimum octane of 87 are acceptable to achieve peak performance and get the FJ's advertised horsepower and torque, premium fuel is required, and it will also likely increase the longevity of the engine as a whole. Meaning if you really care about your FJ, you're now spending more on gas than you would on other vehicles or even later model FJs. The next largest elephant in the room with the FJ Cruiser is the fact that its visibility is so poor that the blind spots could literally hide the elephant in the room. The FJ's C-pillars are humorously wide, and the rear door and rear corner windows are comparable to those of a submarine, making rearward visibility next to impossible and even dangerous at times. Even the front A-pillars are wide enough to cause issues if you're not attentive enough. So to help with the blind spots, it is highly recommended to install blind spot mirrors or even FJ Cruiser specific convex mirrors. These will make life so much better, allowing for improved visibility into your blind spots, and I cannot imagine imagine driving my FJ without them. But rear visibility for the FJ is still limited due to the spare tire being mounted where it is and the short rear window. This makes reversing an act of faith, though at least the FJ could come with backup sensors that help detect what you cannot see. Even a backup camera was added in 2009, but the screen for it appears in the rear view mirror and is so tiny that it is only marginally more useful than not having it at all. One should be very aware of their surroundings when backing up and utilize all the mirrors and other reversing aids when doing so. To speak further on visibility, the FJ has a uniquely narrow front windshield that due to its shape needs three windshield wipers to get the job done. So not only do you have to purchase an extra windshield wiper when it comes time to replace them, but I have also found that short windshield wipers don't seem to work as effectively as longer ones, leading to glass not being wiped as cleanly and excess snow building up in the winter time. For the driver, this narrow windshield also means that if you're at a stoplight, seeing the traffic light itself is impossible and requires leaning down to view it at all. So once again, visibility in the FJ is limiting. And due to the dimensions of the FJ, when off-roading, the hood actually does obstruct a lot of the view and can make seeing the trail ahead next to impossible. The driver's seat thankfully does have a hydraulic pump that can raise the seat up and help with vision, but even at full height, you'll still find yourself questioning what lies ahead, especially over a blind hill or a steep drop-off. I find myself having to get out of the FJ to check what's ahead when wheeling alone, so be aware of that. And unlike some rigs, where it is comfortable to lean out the window and check what's coming up or where you're placing your tire, the FJ's door window seems so high that this cannot be done as comfortably as other off-road vehicles, like Jeeps. The installation of tube doors can help with this, but since many don't have those, and they aren't quite practical in poor weather conditions anyways, this is another struggle when off-roading in the FJ. Going from the exterior to the interior, the biggest flaw of the FJ for some is the lack of four true doors. The FJ Cruiser is actually equipped with suicide doors for the rear, which can make getting in and out a hassle, especially in tight parking spaces. And even when you do climb in the back seat, if you're an average sized adult, you may find it a bit tight. To add insult to injury, the suicide doors have tiny airplane-like windows that cannot roll down. So much for being able to see the scenery if you're the rear passenger. Due to this rear seat and door configuration, FJs don't make for the best family car, and this really holds true if your child is still in a car seat. Cargo room in the back isn't necessarily terrible, but it isn't great either. And if you wanted to sleep in the back of your FJ, which I have done on occasion, even with the seats folded down, it doesn't make the floor perfectly flat. Hence why so many people build their own rear cargo or sleeping decks. But it still might not be comfortable if you're taller than about 5 foot 9 inches. 
As far as electronics go, though in the other video I explain how the simplicity of the FJ is a favorable quality, when it comes to the entertainment system, the FJ is certainly dated. The lack of modern electronic features, like in early models where there's no USB plugs or Bluetooth connectivity, is something that needs to be remedied by installation of a new head unit radio, a project I recently undertook myself. Yet even in later years where Bluetooth was added to the FJ, owners complain of its cumbersome nature and lack of actual aid to the driver as it isn't nearly as refined as in more modern vehicles. Now on current FJs, like those sold in certain markets like the UAE, some come with large upgraded head units that probably work better, but for the older US models, this will always be an issue. Even the audio quality is something some audiophiles criticize. In 2011, the FJ received an audio upgrade with the JBL sound system, but there are those who are still dissatisfied with its sound quality. I personally love the sound of the FJ, but do find that the color matched door trim panels rattle quite annoyingly whenever bass notes hit, especially with the OEM subwoofer. I need to get in there and fix that one of these days, but just haven't gotten around to it yet. As a reminder, some of the things I have mentioned in this video are things mentioned by my FJ Cruiser Changes by Year video, so definitely check that out if you haven't already. But one of the other things mentioned in that video that I will cover once more is how early model FJs can have their own set of problems that need consideration. If your FJ has an early 2006 or 2007 build date, issues such as the notorious fender bulging and cracking can occur. Early FJs also experienced a higher likelihood of rear differential failure, with the ring or pinion gears losing teeth both on and off-road. And if your FJ was built before the TRD Special Editions were released in November of 2006, there is an electrical error where the rear e-locker will override the A-Track system, so you can only use one or the other rather than both at the same time. Hacks can be done to fix this, but it is still a hassle some people have to deal with. 2007 FJs also lack side sun visors, which becomes very noticeable if the sun shines in from the side because of how long the windows are. These were added in 2008 and can be added to earlier models, but it is still silly that Toyota didn't think of them earlier. Mechanically, the FJ is mostly bulletproof, but due to the engine and other components being shared with similar vehicles like the 4Runner, they all experience some of the same issues given time. There is another video by the Car Care Nut I recommend you check out, but I will mention most of the issues here too. For transmissions, if the fluid isn't ever changed, as mileage gets higher, shuddering can occur. And for manual transmissions, folks can experience clutch issues and can have problems with the throwout bearing going out. The FJ Cruiser has always had Toyota's 1GRFE 4 liter V6 engine, but a different version of this engine was used on 07 to 09 models and 2010 and up models. For the early models, problems that can arise include water pump leaks, head gaskets failing due to bad coolant, idler pulleys becoming worn out and noisy, oil leaks from the front timing chain cover, or knock sensor failure, which requires a bit of disassembly of the engine to repair. It is also common knowledge that though the engine will last forever, the alternator will not, with the OEM one failing for most around 120,000 miles, give or take a few thousand miles. So just keep up with your FJ's maintenance, have these fluids changed, and always check for leaks to ensure your FJ is in peak condition. But hope you don't have a 2010 plus FJ when it comes to oil changes, as the oil filter location on these models is underneath, making routine maintenance on these FJs just that much more tedious, especially if you've installed aftermarket skid plates. For the four-wheel drive components on 4x4 models, since the FJ was built as an off-roader, Toyota encourages that the FJ be put into four-wheel drive at least 10 miles every month to ensure that the front drive components are lubricated. I would also encourage that you put the FJ all the way into low four-wheel drive occasionally and even activate the rear locker from time to time. This way, all the mechanical systems of the FJ stay freed up and don't seize, which can be an issue on the FJ with both the four-wheel drive actuator and rear e-locker. Even my own rear locker was seized when I bought my FJ, so be sure to check these systems as well when purchasing your own FJ. 
Time for the lightning round of issues people can have with their FJs. Rattling of the rear cargo door, a 55 to 60 mile per hour steering wheel wobble due to difficulty balancing tires, the roof leaking if the roof rack is not sealed properly upon installation, a limited turning radius which did get slightly better in 2010 and up models, dated halogen lighting making for dim headlights, dim interior lights, and especially dim reverse lights, the combo of the dim reverse lights, tinted rear windows, and poor visibility making reversing at night sketchy, and how the access panel to change the taillight bulbs is so small that you need child hands to get the job done. There is a lack of true fog lights on the FJ, unless you have a more modern one from another country, but we do have plenty of aftermarket options available on the market. The mirror lights are more of a novelty than anything and do not provide any functionality unless completely swapped out for an LED alternative. The stock roof rack also has little functionality and replacing it is a necessity if you really want to use the roof for heavier cargo or for a rooftop tent. And the dated OEM antenna is prone to catching tree branches or getting caught in automatic car washes. The FJ's taillight design is flawed as it has them sticking out so far that they are easily picked off by rocks and trees while doing technical off-roading. And for FJs with the TRD exhaust, the tailpipe is also in an area that can get crushed if doing more serious wheeling. Some people think the towing capacity is lacking, while others think it's enough. Guess it just depends on what you're towing. And the only automatic windows are the front door ones, with the only other window that opens being the rear cargo door. And even then, some people's aftermarket tires block it, or in my case, my rear ladder does. Having a roll down window, as with other Toyotas, would have been a much better option. And speaking of the rear cargo door, if you do camp in the back of the FJ, the cargo door has no latch to open it from the inside, meaning you must crawl over the front seats every time to get out. Some folks have figured out their own latch system to overcome this, but it is still another disadvantage. Other huge things folks have complained about over the years, right up there with the lack of two-door and four-door versions of the FJ, is the fact that the FJ didn't come with a solid front axle. As with the earlier model Land Cruisers or even vehicles in competition with the FJ, like the Jeep Wrangler. And when it comes to power, in the Australian market, folks always dreamed of a factory diesel option. While here in the US, people wanted a V8 engine, like the one available for 03 to 09 Forerunners. There have always been people who want more power or more fuel economy, and both of those are just things you don't get with the FJ Cruiser. It's all about smiles per gallon, not miles per gallon. And as far as FJ Cruiser packages, it is always essential to make sure you check which ones you're getting before you purchase, as the lack of the FJ's convenience package could leave you without cruise control, power mirrors, a rear window wiper, or even keyless entry. Things you just assume all FJs would have. Ideally, you can find an FJ with both the convenience package and an upgrade package at a minimum, but just do your research so you don't end up with a bare bones base model. Ultimately, the final thing I want to say is the FJ Cruiser really is a bad value if all you're looking for is a vehicle with four wheel drive. Even if you're set on a Toyota made vehicle, be sure you take a look at the 4Runner and the Lexus GX line as both are very comparable SUVs to the FJ in capability and function, yet offer additional desirable features at a fraction of the cost to even high mileage FJs. But with all that said, if you love the FJ Cruiser as much as I do, and as much as most others in the FJ community do, then the pros far outweigh the cons, and the FJ Cruiser is still a fantastic vehicle to own. Any small inconveniences are easily overlooked, and compromises are made to make the FJ a part of your life. People comment on almost every video how much they enjoy having their FJ, how it's their favorite car they've ever owned, and how they never plan on selling it. If that's not love, I don't know what is. I hope this video taught you about some of the downfalls of the Toyota FJ Cruiser, so you can now be more aware of what you're buying when you get your own FJ. But in the end, do most of these things really matter to most owners? No. So get out there, get an FJ anyways, and experience it for yourself. Let me know in the comments if there is a problem with your FJ that I didn't mention in this video. I'm curious to see what I may have forgotten. But like the video if it helped you, subscribe, and share this video if you can. I appreciate you all and wish you all the best, especially if you're hunting for your dream FJ Cruiser. More FJ content will be coming soon, but until then, happy trails, keep on FJ cruising, and take care.